So hi everyone, my name is Ravi. I'm the co-founder, CEO of Zeev, uh, one of the leading roll-up as a service provider. Today on our talk show, we have Andy, the founder of The Rollup. Uh, one of the major and very popular channel in the Rollup ecosystem is Modular March, again from The Rollup. So uh, hi, Andy. Uh, we would like to welcome you on this show. Yeah, man. Thanks. Th thanks for having me. We were just talking a bit about Modular March. Super, super exciting um, time that was after after East Denver. Um, you know, I think that that the community really really was opened up in terms of th this idea of modular blockchains and and modularity. And so for us, that was a big sprint, uh, six weeks. And um, the last couple of weeks, we've been we've been resting a little bit. But yeah, excited to excited to be here and 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 talk with you guys. Your solutions um, definitely in demand now. And I think just over the next year, two years, especially we'll see more and more chains launch. So um, yeah, qu quite excited. And thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I think Andy, we can start uh, by, you know, uh, just a more understanding of what, what modularity is, the whole idea the concept behind modular rollups and, you know, how, how it differs uh, from the monolithic blockchains. Yeah. So to me, the idea of modularity is effectively about unbundling uh, the traditional blockchain stack into uh, individualized and specialized parts. Um, so what that means is in a traditional blockchain, you have um, a set of core operations which are required to uh, facilitate uh, transactions and to store data uh, and, and to verify um, uh, blocks and to uh, effectively create the system of um of truth and and it's kind of decentralized these decentralized databases and so what modular blockchains means is basically you can take apart each each uh each individual individualized uh, function of a blockchain and, and almost just outsource it to somebody or an entity or a separate chain which is specifically meant for that process and so you do this enough times and you get this this bigger blockchain built up of individual parts, uh, which when put together makes this modular chain of these kind of outsourced parts, uh, which are uh, more effective and specialized for for doing their job at hand. So I kind of think of it as like a soccer team or a football team, where if you had a team of um, all strikers, you'd probably score a lot of goals but you wouldn't be able to uh, win a championship versus a team that has a really well thought out uh, strategy with a goalie, a defense line, midfielders, attackers, and strikers. And so you kind of get this more uh, balanced uh, blockchain for uh, higher higher levels of scale uh, in the modular fashion. The, the monolithic stack is more like a team of strikers really trying to accomplish all parts of uh, of an important uh, system of a of a blockchain in in one layer, so doing execution, settlement, data availability, and consensus all within one layer versus outsourcing each part of the stack um, into specialized individualized modules. No, I think I I absolutely agree. I think uh, you now what we have seen is, as you rightly mentioned, there's a transaction layer. There's a data availability layer, and then there's a consensus layer, and all three working in conjunction with each other. Of course, you know monolithic uh, blockchains have been a flavor. It's easy to understand, and uh, it's easy to manage. But at the same time, the problem is that you know the limitation of one automatically becomes the limitation of others. It, it's like a uh, like a limiting factor, and and now we have three factors where you know either uh, of of them can become a limiting factor, putting down whether scalability challenges, security challenges, and decentralized challenges, everything become a challenge. And I think breaking down these into three different components, and then, you know, uh, massive players, of course, coming into not just uh, is this good for the uh, uh, scalability of the entire blockchain stack, but at the same time, I believe that it will bring in much, much more innovation. So if it's, let's say, you know, we see data availability, now we are, we are seeing massive players we have Celestia, we have Eigen DA, we have you know Near, we have Avail and and Syscoin D and few other uh, DLAs are coming in. I think and and each of them are bringing a different flavor, a different approach, a different vision, and I think together uh, uh, it is going to disturb you know how 
it's not just about the cost of managing data, but you know how much decentralization they can bring, how easy it can they can make it to plug and play. Because if all these components become plug and play, then I think you know uh, modular blockchains are are going to be a massive, massive uh, upgrade, I would say, over monolithic blockchains. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, from a like from a developer standpoint, like you know we are seeing that rollups have become um, quite popular now. We have quite a few established layer two rollups which have become quite big. Whether you uh, see in the in terms of developer adoption, whether you see in terms of TVL, like you know Arbitrum or zk Sync or uh, you know Optimism, some of these established the linear scroll and so on and so forth. So they have already become massive, and now we are seeing hundreds of rollups are being built across all different categories, whether it be DeFi, payments, gaming, um, um, layer one to layer twos, you know, quite a few of them are moving there. Uh, a lot of centralized exchanges are, are uh, launching their own layer twos. So um, this distraction is coming in. So from a developer standpoint, do you see that this is going to be the trend in the next few years where people will start moving their dApp from a monolithic blockchain to their own rollups? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, so generally, yes. For example, today, or maybe just a couple of days back, but today we covered it on our on our our weekly modular recap live streams. We covered that uh, Celo is one of, is was one of the biggest L ones in in the previous cycle. They're now going to deploy their own uh, optimistic roll up on the OP stack. Um, so they're going to go from L one to L two. Lisk is another one from the ICO era right. that has taken has taken this route. So I think generally, yes, that we'll see more and more of that. I think from a, a, a developer's perspective, you get the you get you get the ability to access the EVM tooling and the Ethereum uh, community and all the infrastructure that's been built around that. Uh, you don't have to uh, you don't have to fight for your own economic security, you're just able to in, inherit the economic security of Ethereum. Um, and generally you get a lot of uh, network effects like using ETH for gas. And you kind of, if you're a rollup, you get access to all these other rollups within the space where it, you know, if, if, if some of these rollups can continue to grow, uh, there's likely going to be downstream effects of TVL of users onto other rollups within the Ethereum space. Now, on the contrary to that, I actually think from a developer experience perspective, building rollups outside of the EVM is going to be more advantageous. Uh, I, I believe that the Solidity code and the programming flaws of the EVM are, are have become more and more apparent and that solutions like some of the um, next gen VMs or alternative virtual machines, the innovations happening at the execution layer uh, from some of the bigger names out there um, movement Labs, Cartesi, Fluent, right. uh, Fuel, um, and so on, Cairo VM, even from StarkNet. These will bring in more developers from a programming language perspective where programmers can come on and build uh, programs in Rust, TypeScript, JavaScript, um, C++, other languages which aren't Solidity, Move, uh, that, that have a developer base that's not necessarily non-crypto native. So I'm pretty excited about the, the idea of onboarding non-crypto native developers to uh, Ethereum rollups, but not necessarily needing to use the, the EVM to do so from a security perspective, from a developer onboarding and understanding perspective, as well as like a, a performance perspective. I think for users, um, you know, we, we will want to uh, operate on chain in a parallel execution based environment. We will want to operate on chain in an environment which has high throughput, something like uh, uh, that is equatable to Solana and the SVM, right? Eclipse is working on something cool there. So I think generally like we're excited about that. Um, and that is gonna bring the next kind of wave of developer onboarding in our opinion to the Ethereum ecosystem. So while I think that there's a lot of people that are really excited about Ethereum rollups using EVM, I generally don't think that we need many more general purpose uh, EVM L2s. I think we need tons more app chains, whether they choose to use EVM or not. Uh, as well as more uh, general purpose and app specific um, non EVM or alternative uh, VM rollups to come into the space to kind of take Ethereum scaling to the next level. Nope. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I think um, you have touched the nerve, and I think 
we see movement labs is one of the exciting piece and then in, in fact they are now launching their own layer two uh so yeah so the way i see it you know uh, uh it's pretty much on the same track as, as as what you're saying that ethereum will become one large decentralized ecosystem where you know you can derive uh, economic security you can derive decentralization from the ethereum chain but then you'll have lots and lots of independence to uh, uh whether it be on on the components we have already touched upon but and as on the programming layer um whatever limitations have been i think the modularity is, is actually playing a major role here because now you can actually plug and play the best of components and create something which solves or, or which aligns very well to your use case some of the use cases do require high throughput low gas you know some of the payment customers that we have but for them uh, or or gaming customers uh, for that matter you know they do require either gasless transactions because they don't have the luxury to charge their customers right so they want the the gas for the gas fee to be actually very low they want the high transaction throughput and they want uh, more innovation on the user experience side you know how we can bring uh, whether it be social logins or web3 auth or, or or all those around abstraction and so on and so forth so yeah so i think uh, um, innovations happening in the programming language side will again help bring in more and more developers reduce the friction of learning a new language they can actually start coding and i think lisp itself i i used to follow lisp during the 2017 18 times and i was very interested because they i think introduced the concept of using typescript or javascript for their smart contract uh, it was pretty exciting and at the same time rust as we know uh is is doing wonders because you know uh, being more uh, uh nearer to machine language i think uh, makes it very faster the smart contracts are faster and and the whole concept of move making the language more secure as compared to solidity where there are a lot of challenges and a lot of hacks etc had happened in the smart contracts i think uh, this is uh, pretty very interesting to seeing a lot of innovations happening across different modules or components of the of the blockchain stack um so if we touch upon let's say some of the uh, uh, other components like data availability and sequences so first talking about data availability so what do you see like you know we already have a few major players and still uh, but there's an option you can use ethereum the settlement layer as the dl layer and then you know there are some other concepts which have come in like you know there are base rollups where you use the ethereum validators or uh, um let's say uh, uh, eigen avs right where you can simply derive the security uh, uh, um from 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 ethereum validators itself so how do you see uh, the whole da piece is going to pan out what what are your, your views on that Yeah so um I I think that the data availability landscape has been um recently uh expanded from the launch of Avail and Eigen DA uh previously Celestia was effectively the only of the only owner of this market they owned the entire market they got quite a bit of a head start uh Celestia uh chose a model uh with their with their light clients and fraud proofs uh that was different from avail and eigen layer um avail uses kcg commitments and eigen layer uses uh, validity proofs so these two models took a little bit longer to de- uh develop and um this uh, celestia kind of got a head start and so i think that generally like the this this concept of data availability is going to move towards where avail is going and where people are rumoring that celestia is is going which is like ultimately competing with ethereum um i think that like th- this idea of data availability being in the same block in this modular stack as uh as consensus is is powerful where data availability is almost the same thing as as consensus um where it, the, it's it's like this last bastion of truth um and you kind of get this this weird model where if you're using celestia or avail for data availability the question ends up ultimately becoming uh can you just settle there as well and not uh not ultimately settle to ethereum um ethereum is the is the settlement layer of course in a lot of these rollups but i think that the that the roadmap for for avail and celestia is both kind of encompassing more of a of a um of a, of a roadmap of kind of doing multiple parts that ethereum ha- is currently doing so i think that's kind of interesting eigen layer is a little bit different eigen da is an avs 
uh, which is, you know, uh, in, inherits its economic security from restaked Ethereum. So it'd be interesting to see how that plays out. But I think Eigen DA will be the, the DA of choice for all of the ADS chains launching. So I think that they'll have that advantage. Um, and then as well as quite a few of the of the chains uh, launching before Eigen Token launches, which I'm not sure. I'm hearing rumors that is this week or next. I don't know when it is, but I think that there's that there's going to be quite a bit of like traction around Eigen Token, and so I think people will want to use Eigen um, DA for for to kind of get into that community. And then I think last but not least, uh, Celestia and, and then some of the others. I think Celestia will just continue to to dominate the mind share of data availability and modularity. So I don't think that they're, I don't think that they're gonna have much of an issue um, kind of scaling their their solution. And I think that, that there's gonna be uh, kind of a commoditization of, the, of data availability and builders are, are gonna look for other things, not just cost. So I think that Eigen DA, Avail, Near, Celestia are all within like an order of magnitude in terms of cost with one another, which I don't think is, is uh, that big of a differential at this point. But I think the more of like developer right. tooling experience, marketing, and these types of things will kind of play a more important role. And then I think like broadly on the stack, people are thinking about the stack too narrowly. I think this idea of execution, data availability, and settlement is like really small. Um, when you think about this, when you think about the modular stack, we're going to see a ton of different types of infra, infra providers be inserted into the rollup frameworks and RASs where you'll have uh, like data indexing, RPCs, proof verification, proof generation, shared sequencers, interoperability providers out of the box. Um, and you'll kind of get like this expansion of the modular stack as we know it from like three core parts to like five to eight, and then on to like 10, 12 and more. And I think that, yeah, I think that's kind of like the the next step in, in the stack. And I expect a lot of like the RAS providers to to uh, offer more and more of these uh, individual parts so that when, when I go and choose to build a chain, I can actually choose a variety of different options from you know six or seven different key parts of the stack. Um, and so I'm kind of betting on, on quite a few of those players uh, to do well um, and, and to have their technology and their infrastructure be adopted uh, amongst uh, the broader uh, stack itself. No, no, I think uh, you're absolutely right. I think uh, uh, what we are seeing um, um, that, you know, lots and lots of innovation needs to happen from the RAS platform perspective. So like when we started RAS about a year back, um, initially the focus was to, you know, how to bring in automation to uh, uh, set up the rollup, you know, how to bring in extensive set of configurations, uh, which is aligned for different use cases or different use case categories. And then you know set up an infrastructure which which with all the core components as well as some of the native components which are pretty much required by everyone. But now we have got into our phase two, and in phase two the idea is to bring in more native integrations because typically what happens is when somebody launches on a on a public chain like Ethereum or Polygon POS, uh, it's easy because you know you you find all the tools that that are necessary if you want to use data indexing, you can simply go to one place. If you want to use account abstraction, you can go to Alchemy or Biconomy. They're already supporting most of the public chains, right? So it's, it's simply you can subscribe, take the API endpoints and start using it. But when you're launching your own rollup, uh, you need to actually get into relationship. Uh, you need to start with a conversation, strike a deal, and then add the support. And they are also, right now, most of the established players, whether it be layer zero on interop side or chain link, or, they, they are not ready uh, to support custom rollups, right? Because, uh, uh, and, and I think, a lot of automation needs to happen here so that whenever a new custom rollup uh, adds and if they want to, let's say, add, add account abstraction, it can be natively available, like what we have seen in Hyperchain. So they have native A, but then it needs to happen with other rollup stacks as well. And and we are taking a lot of, um, you know, uh, bringing a lot of exciting products to this space, whether it be on the explorer side or data indexing uh, or account abstraction. Uh, either partnering with third parties and natively integrating them into our rollup stack, the the rollup as a service stack, or or you know building some of the core components to uh, bring that. And, and I think uh, again the idea is to bring in uh, faster time to market, a much better user experience from a rollup perspective, so that startups don't feel the heat. And I, 
the way I believe it, you know, uh, launching a rollup should be as simple as uh, deploying a smart contract. It should be that easy. And then only we are going to see that more and more uh, developers are start going to uh, uh, move to the rollups. And of course, then cost is another constraint. But there again, I believe this modularity is going to help because once you break down the rollup uh, infra, like, you know, you break down the DA and uh, there's a transaction led pricing, you break down provers. Now we have uh, partners like Jivalet or Sindri who are bringing shared provers, right? So again, you reduce the cost of, so a lot of cost of running a rollup uh, will eventually translate into a transaction led pricing. And then we are going to see it's, it's pretty much similar to the way smart contracts and public chains work. You, you're paying just for the gas fee. I think the same is going to, we are seeing that that already started happening. And I think in the next six months to one year, we are going to see many, many more players enter and make it a completely uh, transaction-led based uh, roll-up ecosystem. So, yeah, so I think uh, pretty exciting. So one one more thing on, on DA side. So one is the roll-up, but then Validium itself is a is a very interesting proposition. And if you see Volition, which is a mix of roll-up and Validium, where you can have a decision based on whether what part of the data needs to be off chain and versus on chain. So, um, and, and we are seeing some interesting use cases, especially uh, use cases which are driven towards enterprise space or enterprises themselves looking at rollups. They do require some kind of privacy and either resort to a, their local DA or a DAC kind of model where they can create a small consortium. So, what, what do you think about Validium and, and Volition? Yeah, I mean, I think that the uh, the the idea behind doing off chain data is is definitely like a revolutionary one. My 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 big um, concern is doing this in the most decentralized way possible. So um, you know, people would I think that there's a clear difference between rollups and volitions and validiums that should be expressed. I think L twos is a fine concept or is a fine terminology to kind of. Uh, ex uh, expand all of these uh, different types of, of chains. Um, but generally, the, the, the way that I look at it is it's, it's always a trade-off between decentralization and, and scale. And so whichever one uh, we can find where it is most, most de decentralized, but also gives us uh, an ample amount of scale, I think that's kind of where we end up always landing as an industry. And so from my perspective, um, you know, whatever the most uh, ethos aligned of, uh, of of crypto as a whole in terms of uh, don't trust, verify, whatever off-chain data uh, source that we can have um, to scale rollups uh, that also embodies that, that kind of sentiment and that ethos, um, I think that's something that, that I'll stand behind. Oh, yeah, yes, absolutely. I you take an example of we have uh, quite a few customers in the healthcare space so. Let's say uh, you want the anonymized data, the transaction data to be on chain, but at the same time, the PII data, which, which is governed by data compliances, need to be off chain. So that kind of combination you do require in, in a lot of use cases, right? And, and within the uh, uh, native space as well, there are a uh, set of data that, that we believe is, is cannot be kept private uh, when we talk about a public chain ecosystem. Now, those use cases can also be built. And I think uh, uh, quite a few use cases people could not believe that they could do on public blockchain just because, you know, there was no way where you can have just a part of the data, maybe 5 10% or 20% of the data, which uh, may come into the purview of, of data compliances uh, to be outside the on-chain ecosystem, right? So that I think, uh, uh, I believe Volition is a very interesting concept. Uh, that will enable those use cases also to embrace blockchain and and and, and a much faster way without worrying about data privacy, etc. And still, from a user standpoint, your transaction data, your bulk of the data is still on chain. It can be easily verified. You can generate proofs and verify with the proofs whether the optimistic rollup or zk rollup. I think uh, makes very interesting. Yeah. So now uh, uh, going on to another core component, which is the sequences. Right now we see. Most of the rollups are using, and I think these are early times. Most of the rollups are using centralized sequencer. So, uh, uh, what, 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 uh, uh, like you know, a brief about what role a sequencer play in a rollup ecosystem, and and how do you believe, um, you know, sequencer are going to grow uh, in in terms of what kind of innovations you are you you see going to happen in next two years. 
Yeah, for sure. So um, a sequencer is effectively a, a piece of hardware which is uh, connected to rollups that is uh, almost like their operator. Uh, the, the sequencer is responsible for uh, transaction ordering, batching transactions into block uh, blocks and, and, and then passing them down to uh, the data availability layer uh, or Ethereum or Celestia, Avail, et cetera. And, and so the sequencer is, gives users what's called pre-confirmations for their transactions. Uh, and so this is kind of why uh, transactions on rollups are so fast because the sequencer, this centralized sequencer gives you a pre-confirmation of, of your transaction within one to two seconds. I think it's a two second block time. Um, and then, uh, you know, your, your transaction is, is, is through and that sequencer goes in, uh, orders those transactions into the block and then goes, goes and posts them, uh, you know, down to the data availability later and then eventually to the L1. And, and so, yeah, right now there's a lot of like, Arbitrum runs their own sequencer. Optimism runs their own sequencer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these sequencers generate a ton of revenue. Uh, so you can think of the revenue as basically the cost to run the hardware, which is uh, pretty minimal when you compare to the total amount of fees that are that are are charged uh, on on the network uh, in terms of of paying gas. And then the uh, um, the equation is basically you have the fees minus the uh, the the hardware costs and minus the uh, the the payment for Ethereum block space on the L1 uh, for every block that that you uh, end up sequencing, batching, and and posting down to the L1, uh, and that's where you end up with your with your surplus. And so a lot of these sequencers uh, have been making a ton and ton of money, um, and have you know been doing things like retroactive grants and uh, funding funding builders and just have been revenue machines. And so I think that's kind of why there's this big desire for apps to go from apps on general purpose L2s to apps running their own app chains, because you you can internalize this uh, this uh, MEV, this MEV, this maximal extractable value in terms of the sequencer surplus. You can control your transaction ordering to a certain extent, or at least have control of the sequencer, uh, which, which does that. And then you kind of get this, consistent revenue machine from the rollup itself if you have enough users and enough demand for block space. In the future, I think that we'll see uh, kind of growth of these shared and decentralized she uh, sequencers, basically where we we have this model of uh, this, this the shared sequencer basically can uh, sequence transactions from multiple rollups at once um, and, and they can come close to achieving what's known as atomic composability, where you can have a uh, transaction on rollup A uh, settle uh, on rollup B at the same time in the same block. Um, you know, right. if you could think of something like, like buy, buy a coin on transaction or on rollup A and uh, uh, bridge it over to rollup B and stake it on rollup B all within the same block. Um, and so that's, pretty, that, that's a pretty neat mechanism. Um, but also I think that's like the bigger idea here is like decentralizing sequencers is going to create more censorship resistant rollup designs. Right now, if if the if the SEC just told Arbitrum like shut it off, guys, like it would it would be problematic in the sense of like they would have to shut it off. There would be other kind of fallbacks happening, like Ethereum sequencing and base sequencing and things. But uh, ultimately, I think the big the big push towards base sequencing, the big push towards decentralized and shared sequencers is is a a gradual push towards more censorship, censorship resistant and resilient designs, which is something that we're that we're pretty excited about. No, oh, absolutely. I think uh, this is something very exciting. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> if you see uh, uh, decentralized sequences, which uh, eventually you know we are going to see uh, picking up. So, um, but how does the economic model will work? You know, um, like today in the centralized sequences, pretty much. You're capturing the entire value uh, by the layer to itself, and and then then there's of course there's some cost to offset that. You know, there's a cost of L1 gas fee, and then there's a cost of infra. But uh, you're capturing the entire value in the terms of sequencer fee. But then with decentralized sequences, how do you see the fee of uh, the revenue share arrangement will work between a rollup and a decentralized sequencer? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a pretty common um, misconception that decentralized sequencers are gonna basically steal all the revenue from uh, sequencers, but I don't think that's gonna happen. 
Um, a couple of the models which I'm, I'm familiar with, one being Espresso and the other being NodeKit, as well as Astria and, and a couple others. Basically, how it's going to work is uh, rollups will will uh, be given the option of of kind of like what amount of revenue that they will uh, be are willing to to give up, if any, in in some models. And in other models, there's going to be a a kind of a shared auction or a lottery model where rollups are kind of bidding uh, for blocks uh, almost against each other. Um, but there, there's this kind of dynamic set of 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 bidding happening where um, the 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 core idea of the final outcome being that each individual rollup doesn't uh, spend more or doesn't lose any more revenue than what it would do in a centralized manner. So yet to kind of see this in, in practice, but I think this idea of shared sequencers dominating and earning all of the rollup revenue for uh, just sequencing is going to kind of be put to rest over the coming months as we see right. the rise of, of some of these uh, shared sequencers pop up. Got it. No, I, I absolutely agree. I think I think that that's that's pretty interesting. Uh so I think uh, um I'll just you know um I think it's it has been interesting conversing about you know different topics. I think we covered modular rollups, different components. Uh just you know uh, a last question. So um somebody who is looking to launch their own rollup, of course it's a uh, it's a very tedious task today, and that's where rollup as a service platforms like Z comes into picture. We enable, we help customers to navigate the rollup, uh, launch their own rollup. Nothing to worry about the underlying infra, configs, etc. Third-party integrations. They can simply focus on, on, um, you know, building their DAP, you know, promoting it, getting more users and transactions. So, how do you, what, what do you think, uh, rollup as a service platforms, how their value uh, in the entire rollup ecosystem will grow over a period of time? Yeah, so I mean, I'm pretty. I think that that it's extremely tough to launch a rollup for a couple of reasons, um, but it it just makes sense to use a RAS partner uh, to go from kind of zero to one in the most efficient manner possible. Um, you know, there's so many things like block explorers, oracles, um, all these different infra providers, which are are uh, you know a, a bit of a hassle. And so using a, a rollup partner to kind of help you go from zero to one is something that I would definitely recommend for uh for for all folks who are trying to go from an app to to an app chain. And um, you know, I, I would I'd continue to test out each of the stacks, see which one you like the most and which community that you you really want to get involved in. And um yeah, launch your rollup. Um there'll be more more coming soon. Thanks, Robbie, for, for having me on. And uh it's been a fun conversation. No, absolutely. Thanks, Andy, for your time. I think it has been a brilliant conversation with you. A lot of uh, interesting insights. A uh, lot to learn uh, out of this uh, session. So I think, uh, and, and we'll definitely would love to have more sessions with you. Uh, either ways, you know, we would love to be part of Modular Math sometime. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks for joining us. I think it has been great. Awesome, man. Thank you.